I am so excited uh, uh, to, to talk to my guest today. It's Patrick Redden Keefe. Uh, Patrick is a, a New Yorker staff writer. Uh, he's the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Say Nothing, which we've talked about on this show before. Patrick, it's great to have you back uh, and, and see your face from this COVID nightmare. Great to be back with you. So we're here today to talk about this amazing new show, Wind of Change. Uh, and before we get to questions, I just want to sort of tell listeners that like, I literally remember where I was in my office the first time we talked about this show and the tip you got about the song Wind of Change. There was something about it, the distinctive song, like the mystery, that period of time, the nostalgia. And it just put this like big shit eating grin on my face. And that smile was still there when I listened to the, the last episode uh, a couple weeks ago. First question for you, Patrick. So like at the New Yorker, You've written about the Sackler family, who are these monsters that pushed Oxycontin like it was Tylenol and helped create the, the nation's opioid crisis. You've covered terrorists. You covered the hunt for El Chapo. You wrote a book about the IRA and the troubles in Northern Ireland and immersed yourself in that history. But your white whale, your Moby Dick, was a 90s power ballad <laughs> called Wind of Change. Can you talk about like the, the genesis of this story that led you on a decade-long journey that got us to today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have this friend, and he, he's a character in the podcast, this guy, Michael Schender Auerbach, who um, I've known for years. We first met, I think, in 2006. And he has been a, a dear friend of mine for years, but also a source. And so over the years at The New Yorker, he would tip me off to things, crazy stories. Um, the way this whole thing started is in 2011, he sent me an email and he said, I had dinner last night with this guy who's a friend of mine who used to work at the CIA. And he told me that there's this song by the uh, 1980s German hair metal band, The Scorpions, called Wind of Change, which is this big song. Um, more in Europe, it's one of the biggest rock songs ever, less so in the US, but in Europe, it's just huge, ubiquitous. It came out right around the time the Berlin Wall fell. And it's all about reconciliation and the end of communism and tyranny. And it was kind of the soundtrack to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the tip that I got from Michael in 2011 was he said, so this guy last night told me that that song was written by the CIA. And that set me off down this <laughs> my, rabbit my hole. My shit eating grin is back. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's just something about this story. And that kind of set me off on, on this path, which all these years, literally almost a decade later, has turned into this this podcast. So can we talk about the, the official story of, of, of Wind of Change? I think it involves Ozzy Osbourne, Motley Crue, Bon yeah. Jovi, and a, and a big concert. I mean, this is the story that the CIA wants us to believe, right? Yeah, and the uh, and the Scorpions and the and other people involved. Yeah, so the I mean the, the it's such a wild story. And I didn't I didn't I had never heard of any of this stuff before I dug into it. So rock and roll had basically been banned in the USSR. Um, there was a sense that it was very closely associated with the United States, um, but also that the whole ethos of rock, this kind of rebel ethos of individualism and and uh, sort of free expression, um, was inimical to the kind of totalitarian rule that the Kremlin counted on. So they basically banned rock. You couldn't you couldn't buy records. If you wanted to have a rock band in the Soviet Union, there was a whole weird thing where you could, they did have some what they called official bands, but what that meant is like, mm. you could only perform when they wanted you to perform and they had to censor your lyrics. And I mean, the whole thing was not very rock and roll, you know, it was yeah, you'd, you'd no. be kind of a state, a state organ. Um, so in 1989, there's this concert, it's a music festival in Moscow and summer of 1989, Things are just starting starting to kind of ease up and loosen up mm -hmm. a little bit. And there's this, this festival called the Moscow Music Peace Festival. And it's the first rock festival in Russian history. Uh, and it's all of these heavy metal acts. It's um, like Ozzy Osbourne, Motley Crue is there, Skid Row, John Bon Jovi was there, and the Scorpions are there. And they do this crazy two-day concert. And the story goes that Klaus Meine, the, the lead singer of the Scorpions, goes and performs in this concert and he takes a boat ride on the Moskva River. And he's so inspired by all the change he sees happening around him that he writes this song, 
wind of change. And there's a few things about this that are weird. So the Berlin Wall hasn't fallen yet at the point where he writes the song. He actually writes it. It was released just after the wall comes down, but he writes it before. He also never wrote songs before that. So this is like, like there was another guy in the band who wrote all the songs up to this point, but he writes this song. Um, he'd done lyrics before, but this time it's like the music and the lyrics and he basically shows up and he's like, look guys, I got a song. Um, and they release the song and it becomes this huge, huge hit. In the process of reporting out this story, you talk to all these ex-spies. How did those conversations go? Like, were they wary of you? Did you ever worry that, you know, you're trying to extract information from people who are trained to to lie to you and deceive you? Yeah, it was a weird one. I mean, I, I've written, I've certainly written about espionage before and had uh, sources who were ex-spies and, and friends who were, uh, were former spies. Um, this one was especially weird because of the nature of the thing I wanted to ask about, right? So if it happened, if the CIA was involved, which is certainly, you know, what I knew from the start is like, that's a story that's told inside the CIA. Um, the, the one thing I knew for sure was that, uh, it's still highly, highly classified. And so then it becomes this weird thing where you're talking to people who in some instances take some coaxing to talk at all. And then you're asking them about something that, you know, if they do know about it, it would probably be illegal for them to tell you about it. Do you remember the story you told me like 10 years ago? Yeah, you know that Patrick and I have been utterly obsessed with this story for the past 10 years. And so we've been chasing down leads, asking people, we have a full-on map of multiple different relationships trying to figure out the veracity of the story that you told. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do it in the form of a podcast. And I know that it would be difficult for you to tell it on the record, but I'm wondering if you would do it with like... Um, you know, a different name and a scratchy voice and, and be interviewed. Right, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Understood, don't want that to happen. I do not want you to go to jail. I do not want you to be arrested under felony charges or even worse. Okay, good chatting. What happened? He was just like, it's a felony. There's no fucking way I can tell you the story on the record with my voice, anything like I'll go to jail for this. Along those lines, I mean, look, I imagine that if uh, the CIA helped write a, a rock song that helped bring down uh, the, the USSR, that would be viewed as a great success within the agency. But there's also this dark history of supporting coups, propping up dictators, otherwise meddling in, in the affairs of sovereign nations. Do you get the sense that, that those kind of activities are looked at with pride or, or is that a bygone era of things that shouldn't have been done and, and no longer are done? It's a great question. And, and we talked to a whole bunch of people who had different points of view. Some of it, I think, is a question of when people come into the agency. It's fascinating because there's a, there's a big generational divide where um, a ton of people flooded into the agency post 9-11. And for those folks, they talk about the bad old days, you know, of the of the 50s and 60s as though that's ancient history and we don't do that stuff anymore. Um, you know, as though, as though there's like a turned page and there were lessons learned. But then we talked to some folks who were around in those days and it's like, hell yeah, I was involved in the the Allende <laughs> operation. You know, I mean, they're, they're like they're not not yeah. particularly apologetic. Um, there were, there were some of these interviews that didn't even end up in the podcast, um, but where I was sort of surprised, um, at the, the degree to which people were willing to defend that kind of thing now. In terms of songs and propaganda, this was another really interesting thing is that, um, we interviewed a bunch of ex-spies, ex-CIA people, and I don't think we encountered anybody who, um, first of all, whether they knew about the story or not, nobody blinked an eye as to the question of like, could the CIA have written a pop song? Would they have done it? Everybody was like, oh yeah, absolutely. We, you know, wouldn't necessarily be that we wrote it in house. We would have somebody outside do it, but that certainly is within the realm of the possible. We also didn't encounter anybody who, who said, yeah, and that would be pretty fucked up if we did that. Um, there was a sort of general sense that um, that would be fair game. 
The flip side, though, is, you know, we went to Ukraine, we went to Moscow, we went to St. Petersburg, we interviewed fans. I went to a Scorpions concert in Kiev. We talked to people who, for whom that music means a lot. And that song means a lot. And there are these weird moments along the way where I would kind of be laughing as if it's all a big goof to me. And you talk to someone for whom the song Wind of Change is this like transformational political moment in their youth. And uh, you tell them it might've been written by the CIA. And I, you know, I had these moments, I mean, we have them on tape, but these moments where people are, people are basically like, fuck you, don't yeah. tell me that, you know? There's some emotional interviews. I mean, uh, well, uh, again, this was the most fun series to just get to hear over time and watch the incredible work you guys did and just be in some way associated with. So I, I'm so glad uh, to talk with you about it. And oh, everyone, again, subscribe to Wind of Change on Spotify. You can binge the whole thing. You're not going to want to wait a fucking week to get to the next episode. Just trust me here. It's free. Don't whine at me that you don't have Spotify. Just download it for God's sake. Uh, Patrick, great talking to you. Hey, you too, man. Thank you.